Um, so I am going right before happy hour. Tyler told us that things go better if you go after lunch rather than before. I can imagine that's only more true if you're talking about happy hour. <laughs> Probably better to go after. But that said, this is going to be a great presentation. Uh, <laughs> awesome. All right. So um, I'm here to talk about the evolution of the PM career. I chose this topic because I found that there were a lot of really great resources out there if you are looking for ways to get into product management. There's also a lot of really great resources out there for once you've become a product manager, how you can be a better product manager. But I found a lack of resources available around what to do when you actually become a product manager. What do you expect? Um, so I want to talk to you today a little bit about that. Um, first, I'll start with the evolution of my career. So this is me. Um, I started at Zynga, as many of you know. Um, I actually got there because I was a college student. And like any good college student, I was very good at procrastinating. And I would procrastinate by playing Zynga games. Um, it got so bad that I would actually be late to class because I had to harvest my crops in Farmville. Um, true story. <laughs> so um, when it became time to look for a career, I started investigating Zynga. And it turns out that the core value of Zynga is to connect the world through social games. That's pretty beautiful, right? There's actually even been people who have gotten married because they've met on playing words with friends. Um, so totally bought into the mission, loved playing the games, went to work at Zynga, um, and it was an amazing opportunity. So I got to build games across both web and mobile products, um, and I launched uh, product teams in both Europe and North America. Um, while I was living in Europe launching these product teams, I was traveling around a lot. Um, you guessed it, I was staying in Airbnbs. Um, so pretty much every weekend, I would be in a different European country, staying in a different Airbnb. Um, and in fact, towards the end of my stay in Europe, I was living out of Airbnbs full time. Turns out London's a very big city, which is where I was living. Um, it has about 8 million people. Um, it's about 10, 10 times the size of San Francisco in terms of land mass. So we have all these great neighborhoods here in San Francisco. There's even more in London. Um, and so I couldn't fathom leaving without getting to explore all of them. So I started living out of Airbnbs full time for a month at a time. I had two big suitcases. That was it. That was pretty much all I owned in life. I would travel around. Um, and same story. I was basically spending all of my money on Airbnbs. I was spending all of my time looking for Airbnbs. So I figured it was time to go work for Airbnb. Um, Airbnb's mission is to belong anywhere. And what's more beautiful than that? So enough about me. Let's talk about you. You're PMs, right? PMs love graphs like this, right? What do we love more than graphs like this? Graphs like this. <laughs> so it's pretty natural to want to plot your career along a graph that looks like this, right? Pretty strong up into the right trajectory. We actually lovingly call this a hockey stick because it looks like a hockey stick. Um, but we don't usually really love graphs that look like this, right? They're full of uncertainty. Um, what I'm here to tell you, though, is that oftentimes your career will look like this, and that's totally fine. My own career has looked like this. I actually wasn't always sure I wanted to be a product manager. I started off with an engineering background. I had an internship at a great company called VMware. They specialize in um, virtualization and cloud computing. And as soon as I got there, I realized that I hated it. <laughs> I didn't hate VMware. I just hated being an engineer. Um, so what did I do? I started talking to other people who worked at VMware. There were other interns, um, primarily business school interns, and they were product management interns, and their job sounded awesome. So I wanted to figure out how I could have an awesome job. <laughs> so I learned everything that I possibly could from them. I spent the entire senior year adapting my co coursework so that I could be a better candidate for product management jobs, and then I became a product manager. So it has a happy ending, but there were some serious points of confusion along the way. And that's fine. I get a lot of uh, questions about advice for PM careers. Um, and usually they go something like this. The question starts off with, I'm trying to decide whether or not I want to be a manager. And we'll talk about the pros and the cons. Usually there's some concern that if you move away from your technical skills, it'll be too hard to go back later, or management just feels like the right thing to do next. There's also a lot of questions like this. It's a great company, but it would mean a pay cut, or it would mean a title cut, and that doesn't sound so great, right? The only question I hate more than this is this one. It's a great opportunity. I would be a senior director. What's the problem with these? They're all super short-sighted, right? These are not the right reasons to join a company. These are not the right reasons to pick a career. They're the right reasons that maybe you want to optimize for the next year or so of your life. But 
you'll probably be working for about 50 years. Ah, <laughs> that's like an unfathomably long period of time, right? Um, my dad just retired this year. Hey, Dad. Um, <laughs> he's 67 years old. He would probably hate me for telling you that. But 67 years old, he worked for about 47 years. That is a long time. Um, so what can you do during 50 years? Turns out you can do a lot of things. You can be a manager. You can be an individual contributor. You can be a manager again. You can be an individual contributor again. And you can change your mind about 100 times. You can work for a big company. You can work for a small company. Or better yet, you can work for a big company and then a small company <laughs> and then a big company. Um, so the great news is you want to optimize your career for 50 years, and you can accomplish a lot in 50 years. Throughout this presentation, you'll see that I really hone in on a few key points, and this is the first one. Think about your career in terms of a 50-year trajectory and optimize for that. Cool. So even 50-year-long careers have to start somewhere, and in the product management career track, it typically starts off as an entry-level PM. This is called different things at different places. You might see like APM, which typically stands for associate PM, or RPM, like a rotational PM, or very creatively, every once in a while, you'll just hear PM level one, something like that. Um, usually what it means is that you do work with help. So what does that actually look like? For each stage in the product management career, we're gonna talk about things that you'll do, and then things that you'll learn. So what are some things that you do as an entry level PM? Typically, you'll iterate on existing products. This is a good thing. You'll be overwhelmed by the amount of responsibility that you typically have as a brand new PM, but the good news is that you'll be working on products that ideally are pretty risk adjusted. That way, if you screw up, you don't screw up too bad. Good news for everyone, right? Iterating on existing products can still be really fun and exciting because iteration doesn't have to mean that it's really small. You can have really, really large iterations. In fact, for those of you taking product school right now, You'll often hear us bring up the example that the iPhone camera is an iteration, right? It wasn't until the iPhone 4 that the iPhone camera got really, really good. And today, you can't even really imagine using anything other than your phone to take a picture. That's an example of an iteration. A product manager worked on that. You'll also learn to work with other disciplines. For some of you, depending on what you did before you were a PM, this might be the first time you're doing that. You'll work with marketing, engineering, design, data science, content strategy, and many more. What's exciting about this is they'll all come from diverse perspectives. And what's exciting for you is that you'll get to know lots of different people around the company. Lastly, you'll start to interpret and present results. So as you're building these products, they'll have impact on the business. It's your job to synthesize that impact and present it in a way that people can understand. More importantly though, as you're doing all this, what are you actually going to learn? Firstly, you learn that experiment results are never what you expect. Tyler already gave my favorite example about this earlier today, but Dan Ariely has this famous experiment where basically giving people more options, even when they were obviously bad, performed better than giving people fewer options. I've seen this countless times across both Zynga and Airbnb. Sometimes you might make a button bigger. When you make a button bigger, what do you think will happen? More people click on that button, right? Uh-oh, you shipped it, and fewer people are clicking on that button. Well, we didn't expect that, right? Here's the problem. People, by nature, are irrational. Dan Ariely, author of this experiment, wrote an entire book about it called Predictably Irrational. So if you try to predict what people are, how people are going to respond to your products or what the results of an experiment will be, you'll probably be wrong, and you'll learn that very quickly. Next. You learn that human emotions are incredibly complex. So as you start working across lots of different, different disciplines, you'll find that communicating with them in the same way doesn't always work. You'll find that some people like to think through things very objectively, very rationally, and some people like to think through things very emotionally. That's okay. It's your job as a PM to learn to cater to both. PMs are nothing if we're not good at adapting. And lastly, this is my favorite example, you learn never to leave a messaging app open while you're presenting. The first time you do this, you'll learn never to do it again. So, I mentioned earlier, I'm gonna create some salient points throughout this presentation. For each step in the PM career, I wanted to present one that I think really encapsulates the learnings that you'll get at this stage. For an entry-level PM, 
It's this one. <laughs> Always sign out of messenger applications when presenting. It really is the most important thing I can teach you. All right, so congratulations. You survived your first few years as a PM. You're now no longer an entry-level PM, and you can just do work. Still with help sometimes, but more autonomously. So what will you do? You'll build entire end-to-end -end products. This is really exciting. What's an example of an end-to-end -end product? Basically every single thing on your phone, right? Basically every single website that you go to. A PM had a hand in building those. You'll also learn how to articulate vision and get buy-in. We've talked in many of these presentations about kind of the soft power or leading by influence that PMs have. This is where you'll really put that into practice. As an entry-level PM, you may or may not have a more senior PM working on the same team as you. As a fully functioning PM, you probably won't. And so leading by influence will become your lifeblood. Lastly, you learn to use both qualitative and quantitative decisions or metrics to make decisions. What I mean by this is you'll work with both data science to look at things that your users are actually doing, and you'll also typically work with user research to learn why they're doing them. This is super important and really exciting when you want to build the future of your products. But again, that's what you'll do, so what will you actually learn? Well, you'll learn that things don't always work. One of my favorite examples of this comes from Coca-Cola. It's a little bit of an urban legend at this point, so I apologize if any of the details are a little bit hazy. But Coca-Cola, very famously, had the majority of the market share for the beverage business. All of a sudden, PepsiCo launched something called the Pepsi Challenge. Does anyone remember the Pepsi Challenge? Yeah, what was the premise? You guys remember? Blind tasting, exactly, right? You have a table, you have two cups, you have Coca-Cola, you have Pepsi, you have people taste both, they say which one they like better, and what did they always choose? Pepsi, ooh, painful for Coke, right? Yeah, this is broadcast everywhere. Pepsi put a lot of marketing dollars behind this. And so what started to happen? All of a sudden, it was actually working. Pepsi started actually taking market share away from Coke. And so what did Coke do? Coke said, well, we have a problem. Pepsi tastes better than Coke. We need to make Coke taste better than Pepsi. So they created a new formula for Coke, and they tested it. They ran user research groups. They put it in front of people on the streets. And the feedback they got was awesome. All of a sudden, Coke tastes better than Pepsi again. Yay, we did it, right? Cool, so let's put it on the shelves and let's call it New Coke. Awesome, new's better than old, right? Coke's better than Pepsi, it's gonna work brilliantly. What happened, does anyone know? Yeah, it did not work brilliantly. <laughs> Unfortunately, nobody bought it. So even though it was well-researched, even though it was done with the best intentions, it didn't work. So luckily the story has a happy ending for Coke at least, they decided they had another brilliant plan. They were gonna roll it back. All of a sudden, we're gonna put our old Coke back on the shelves. But if we do that, we're kind of like admitting failure, right? That's not so great. So what are we gonna do instead? We're gonna put our old Coke back on our shelves, but we're gonna call it Coke Classic, right? That's like nostalgic. That's not a failure, that's beautiful. This brings you back to your childhood. So Coke Classic goes back on the shelves. All of a sudden, what happens? Coke regains their market share. Happy endings, right? So, things don't always work, but that's okay. Just learn from your mistakes. You'll also learn the importance of proactive communication. So, we like those graphs where things are going up and to the right, right? What happens when things are not going up and to the right? Uh, you start getting a lot of questions. What do we do to avoid questions? We send out proactive communication. Uh, so, this will be your best friend. When things don't go well, or honestly, even when they do, you wanna make sure that you get ahead of it so that you can control the narrative. There's nothing more important than sending an email with great results celebrating the team, except for maybe sending an email about bad results and explaining why it's happening. That shows how passionate you are about the product, that shows how on top of your metrics you are, and that shows that you care even more about this than your superiors do. And ultimately, that's all they want. Except for maybe revenue, they probably want revenue. All right, lastly, always deflect praise and always absorb blame. What does this mean in practice? This means when things go really well, you say, look at me, I did that. And when things didn't go so well, you say, ooh, that was the team. I had nothing to do with that. 
No, right? No one wants to work on that team. That team sounds horrible. What this actually means is that when things go well, you thank the team. And when things don't go so well, you take accountability. Doesn't sound that fun, but I promise you that as a product manager, people will find a way to give you credit anyway. So as much as possible, you want to deflect that towards the team. So as a PM, what do you think the primary lesson is? Deflect praise and absorb blame. All right. Congrats, guys. You did a great job as product managers. The next step in your PM career is you get to manage product managers. You get to help others do work. So what does this actually look like? It means you'll spend a lot of time attracting and retaining top talent. This can mean anything from writing job recs, not very glamorous, but super important, to making sure that those people who are actually on your team are unblocked, they're passionate about the vision, they're excited, and that they're learning and growing. This is one of your primary responsibilities because without a team, you can't do as much as you can with a team. You also start to develop frameworks for giving advice and solving problems. As a manager, you'll get asked a lot of questions. Sometimes it'll be about things that you personally have never experienced before. How can you possibly give advice about something you've never experienced before? You can develop a framework. This will be a great way to help aid you aid other people. So this way, you won't actually have to have experienced it yourself to still be able to give valuable advice in a knowledgeable and helpful way. The last thing you'll do is you'll give constructive feedback. I think there's a misconception that people don't like negative feedback. If I tell you that your writing style isn't great, that's negative feedback, right? Does that feel good? Not really. But if I help coach you about how to have a more effective written communication style, is that helpful? Yeah. Are you going to come back and thank me one day because you're now better with written communication? Probably. So do you guys like that kind of feedback? Yeah? Can I get some nodding? Come on. Yeah, there we go. Now we're talking. Cool. Thanks, people online, too. Um, you learn to give constructive feedback. That's actually helpful. So that's what you'll do. But what will you learn? You learn to become a better PM yourself. There's this famous quote that often gets attributed to Albert Einstein, which is that if you can't explain something simply, you probably don't understand it. I don't really know whether or not Albert Einstein said that or not, but what I do know is that there's this guy named Richard Feynman. Richard Feynman is a Nobel Prize winner in physics, and he has this theory called the Feynman Technique. And what the Feynman Technique says is that the best way to learn something is to explain it to others. And so what you'll find is that very organically, as a manager of product managers, You'll be explaining lots of techniques to them. You'll be formalizing concepts and creating frameworks. And this, in turn, will actually help make you a better product manager, because through explaining, you'll start to understand the concepts better yourself. You'll also learn the great feeling of watching someone else blossom. As a product manager manager, or a manager of product managers, the highs will be a lot higher. The lows might sometimes be a lot lower. There's nothing more cringeworthy than somebody you manage sending an email that you know is just not a good email and is going to kind of explode in their face. But <laughs> there's no better feeling than watching somebody who you manage get promoted for the first time or write their first experiment results right up, and it's amazing. So I hope that one day all of us in this room are not only managers, but managers of product managers. Lastly, you'll be reminded of the age-old adage, which is that People don't leave bad jobs, they leave bad managers. We have about 24 hours in the, the day, right? Yeah. Um, 24 hours in a day, about eight hours sleeping, if you're lucky, 16 hours left. You spend typically at least eight of those at work, right? For many people, sorry if this is a little bit depressing, you might spend more time with your manager than like any other human being, right? <laughs> So it's pretty important that you like this person, that you feel that they're helping you grow, and that they're generally a positive influence on your life. If you feel that way, you'll probably stick around for a while, right? And if you don't feel that way, you might not. So the lesson for PM managers is people don't leave bad jobs, they leave bad managers. So don't be a bad manager. <laughs> All right, next step. Enable others. 
What happens after you're a manager of product managers? You're a manager of managers of product managers, right? And all of a sudden, your ability to drive impact becomes so much higher. You can think of it sort of as like inverted pyramids where your visibility becomes much greater and the point on the pyramid might be your ability to actually drive scope or drive impact. And you're, you might personally be doing less, but your visibility and your ability to enable others will be so much higher. So what does this actually look like? What do you do? You'll solve problems. Lots of them. <laughs> um, I intentionally did not call this firefighting because um, an anonymous family member of mine once had a conversation with my brother where he said he was fighting lots of fires at work. Um, and this anonymous family member called me very upset asking if I heard about the fire at Facebook headquarters, <laughs> which is where my brother works. <laughs> so <laughs> you may or may not literally be firefighting, but you will be solving a lot of problems for people. Um, in fact, you'll be solving so many problems that you'll actually have to prioritize the problems that you solve. And you can typically think about this across two vectors. So problems typically have urgency and importance. In a perfect world, in a perfect world if something is not urgent and not important, you're not doing it. Also in a perfect world, if something is urgent and important, you did it before it was urgent. <laughs> so you want to stay in the bucket where things are not urgent but important. But often what you see as you progress through your career is you focus a lot on things that are very urgent and very important. And so you have to prioritize your time very ruthlessly. You also start to set the direction for an entire company initiative. This could mean anything from you are now running all of driver services at Uber to you could be drafting up an entire company reorganization for a company like Google. But the ability for you to drive scope and massive impact increases significantly with every step along the PM career trajectory. And this step is largely the ultimate one. So your ability to drive scope and impact is pretty much limitless. Lastly, you'll bring the donuts. Does anybody know what this means? Raise your hands. Oh, good. We'll learn something today. So <laughs> bring the donuts. Um, there's a famous man named Ken Norton. I highly recommend subscribing to his blog if you haven't already. It's called Bringing the Donuts. Um, and here's the basic premise behind this concept. Basic premise is engineers write the code, right? It's pretty easy to grasp. Designers design things. Makes sense. Data scientists analyze things. So what exactly do PMs do again? We bring the donuts. <laughs> and what it's meant to symbolize is that we basically do whatever it takes to get the job done. You're there to enable others. And this is true even in the earliest stages of the PM career, but it becomes even more true over time. So what does a PM do when the director of engineering can own entire end-to-end -end problems and actually even manage a PM team? We bring the donuts, right? So basically, you do whatever you possibly can to get things done faster, more efficiently, of higher quality. All right, so what do you learn? You learn how to multiply your team's impact through effective leadership. This might sound like micromanagement. Sometimes you are micromanaging people, but it might be because you need to. Sometimes it means just getting out of people's way and letting them do their work because that's what will make them most successful. It's your job to identify where you can have the largest impact, to multiply the efforts of your entire team, and to do that. You'll also start to build out your product philosophy. What I mean by this is you'll be able to answer higher order questions. So how many of you have called customer support for, honestly, any company recently, and gone through that fun little game of press two for X, press three for Y, press four for Z? Yeah? People know what I'm talking about? Cool. How many people find that to be an enjoyable experience? No hands. Great. Yeah. So why do companies do that? We all know what it is. We all know that we hate it. So why do people do it? Well, customer support is typically the highest operating expense for companies. So if they can automate it as much as possible and route all these issues so that they can be solved as quickly as possible, they can reduce their highest operating expense. That sounds pretty good for the company. But who suffers in this situation? Customer, right? So what do you do if you have something that's good for the company, bad for the customer? 
this is where your product philosophy can help. Because that's actually a pretty fundamental core question. And your product philosophy can help dictate what the right answer is. Lastly, you learn effective operation. So the fact that we're even talking about customer support routing is emblematic of just how much your impact and scope increases as you move up the PM career trajectory. All of a sudden, you might be responsible for operating an entire arm of an industry, let alone a company. And that's pretty massive. So what's the lesson for manager of product managers? Craft your product philosophy. This might feel a bit abstract, so I wanted to walk you through mine. This is it. Pretty simple, right? One sentence. Customers first, business second, ego last. So what would I do in this situation where customers are losing, but the business is winning because it's really hard to contact customer support? Any guesses? Spend money. Yeah, exactly. It's important, right? It's important that the customers have a great experience. If I had a different product philosophy, business first, customer second, I might make the exact reverse decision. And neither one is honestly necessarily wrong. It's just innate to who you are, and it's important that you understand that. So, in summary, starting out, you want to plan for the long term. Think of your career in terms of a 50-year trajectory. Entry-level PM, what do you do? You do work, largely with help from others. And that's okay. It's risk-adjusted. As a PM, you just do the work. <laughs> you still get some help, but that's okay, more autonomously. As a PM manager, though, you get to help do others do work, which is really exciting. And as a manager of managers, you actually enable others. So as a reminder, what are my five lessons? Think of your career as a 50-year trajectory. Never keep Slack open while presenting. <laughs> Deflect praise and absorb blame. People leave bad managers, not bad jobs. And craft your product philosophy. All right. Thank you.